Hey everyone, welcome to our Wednesday release of the podcast where we're talking about Bitcoin. Boy, things could not be getting more high adventure than what we're seeing in this space right now with the price action. At the middle of April, we saw an all-time high in Bitcoin of nearly $65,000. And as we're releasing this in the middle of May, the price has experienced a major correction clear down to $40,000. For the people not accustomed to an asset with this much volatility, I've tried to bring on two of the best guests to assist through the chaos, and that's Jeff Booth and Lynn Alden. During the show, we address many hot topics currently in the news from energy concerns, centralization concerns, speed of payment concerns, the altcoin season that we're currently seeing, how corporate boards might be viewing the volatility, and much, much more. I'm super thankful to Lynn and Jeff to record this discussion with nearly no advance notice, and I hope you guys enjoy the chat. Guys, such uh, just is so excited to have you here to have this chat because, man, it's getting crazy out there. (laughs) It's uh, it's getting a little insane. So, um, I want to just open it up to you guys. Like, how are you guys seeing things right now? Because it kind of, to me, it felt like this thing was on a rocket ship and then somebody shot the wing off over the weekend. And, uh, now it's just chaos and FUD and fear and people were going crazy. So I just want to kind of capture some of your thoughts initially, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the way I'm looking at it is that, you know, uh, we can use different kind of on-chain indicators and, and basic, you know, sentiment analysis to see how it's going. And for a while, uh, you know, it was kind of on track where the bull market looked a lot like the 2017 post having bull market. Uh, and so now it's starting to look a little bit more like the 2013 uh, bull market where it had a, it had a longer correction in the middle there. Uh, it had like a six month, uh, you know, uh, a pretty significant correction. But it's interesting so far because it's kind of a hybrid. And so it's, in terms of percent loss, uh, so far, it doesn't really deviate from the 2017, uh, you know, bull market at all. So some of those uh, corrections were down, you know, in the high 30% range, uh, close to 40% in some cases. Uh, none of them lasted this this kind of three month period that we're seeing now, and so in that in that way is looking a little bit more like the 2013 uh, period. And so I'm kind of analyzing it like I do any other asset class. And so, for example, in my research service, I cover multiple different asset classes, and generally what you see is that if if everybody kind of you know within an, within an industry gets kind of super bullish at the same time, that's when you're likely to get have kind of pullbacks and corrections and things like that. And so I think you know, now we're seeing that. I saw a similar thing with gold last year, where after the initial you know kind of CARES Act fiscal stimulus, we saw of course the big run up in in, in gold. Uh, but then when you got to kind of late summer of 2020, uh, you started to get a, a real rates kind of rising a little bit off of their off of their lows. Uh, you started to get a rollover in gold sentiment, uh, right? And so you were in kind of a, a long-term gold, uh, you know, kind of an eight-month correction. Uh, and just when everybody kind of thought it was dead, that's, of course, when it when it kind of bottoms a little bit and shows some life. And so we, we kind of see similar things with, with Bitcoin where it's on, you know, they're on different clocks, right? So when, when you know, you know while, while gold was correcting that that time and it kind of, you know, benef- you know kind of being harmed by that rising real rate phenomenon, Bitcoin was was doing better. And so now it's rolling over a little bit. Uh, we have some of the people that, for example, have been, you know, avoiding it this whole time now doing victory laps because it went down 30 some percent, uh, you know, you know, kind of ignoring the fact they went up hundreds of percent uh, in the cycle. Uh, and so, you know, it's hard to say whether or not this has been the bottom or if we're going to see a deeper correction later. Uh, but so far that, you know, the overall network effects are still in, in place. It's just that if you if you look across the board at sentiment. You had pretty strong sentiment in Bitcoin, and then you had really bubbly sentiment uh, in the broader, you know, the crypto space, where you had Ethereum Classic outperforming Ethereum. You had Dogecoin, <laughs> you know, going to the moon. You had, uh, you know, people are inventing, uh, you know, new coins called Cum Rocket and things like that. And so, you know, when you and when you get to that phase, uh, you start to get a really kind of dilutive effect in the industry, where a lot of the enthusiasm that might otherwise be for Bitcoin starts spreading out. And we started to get kind of this temporary issue where like Bitcoin scarcity stops mattering because everyone can just issue more more coins and people can pile into more coins. That's kind of a similar thing you see at the top of equity bull markets, or at least local tops, I should say, where if there's a crazy demand for equities, all sorts of cr- crappy companies can issue equity and, and give as much equity as people want. And it's not until you kind of clear some of that out that you see which companies actually, you know, their equity is really worth something. So considering 
we still have many altcoins outperforming Bitcoin. Is your opinion that there's still more selling to go from where we're at right now? And just for people, I think we're we're around uh, forty four thousand right now. What, it, based on what you're saying, it sounds to me like you think that there's a little bit more selling to happen. I don't have a strong opinion either way. I mean, I think you know we haven't seen some crazy capitulation where yeah. just you know we're kind of like a death spike, and but you know we, we've seen uh, a pretty prolonged uh, down move, and so I'm kind of at the point now where I'm not getting very clear intermediate term price signals. And so I don't, you know, I try to do the thing where if I if I have conviction about something, I'll say it. And if I don't know something, I'll say I don't know. And so in terms of the next three months or so, I don't have a fir- firm opinion either way about Bitcoin's move. I it, it, I remain basically strategically bullish while being pretty agnostic about near-term price action at this time. Jeff? I think that just was a really great way to say it. Uh, the, the, nothing has stri- changed, nothing on the structural why Bitcoin. And and the game that's going to be played for a long time, ups and down on the way through. You have a network effect. One thing I think a lot of people are making a mistake on Bitcoin and comparing the other altcoins is they're comparing it to, let's say, in the technology world, Google or Yahoo. They're, this is a protocol. It's like investing in the internet with a network effect. <laughs> and, and so the other things on top aren't that. But to to uh, to to Lynn's point, from what let's look at ninety nine two thousand um, is in in the internet boom. You had a whole bunch of companies in a short term doing better than Amazon yeah. um, it, because because it's they started at a low and they could say balls dot com like crazy things that would uh, that because. Uh, you could write a, a business plan and put it on a, a, a napkin and anybody would finance it, to, hoping to catch the magic of Amazon and others. And and it creates a whole bunch of extra um, uh, race in the market, trying to get rich quick schemes. And so when you see a bunch of the altcoins and everything else, um, that's that's what I see. I see a a really bubbly type of market. What I worry about a little bit is that's going to hurt some people. Um, And, and, and they, they're going to miss kind of the really important aspects of why Bitcoin is important, really critical. And they're going to kind of lump all the cryptocurrencies into the same, same game. But if you fast forward, what happened in the the dot com uh, bust, a whole bunch of, premium names also fell and 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 then after uh, after that nothing changed on the fundamentals they reinforced and grew and grew and grew so we have elon musk goes out <laughs> buys a billion dollars plus puts it on his balance sheet a couple months back uh, i think his cost basis is still lower than where we're at right now at forty four thousand dollars of bitcoin um he, uh, uh, Jack Dorsey talked about how Bitcoin creates this massive incentive structure for the, uh, renewable energy. Elon, uh, replies to Jack Dorsey saying he agrees. And then out of nowhere, uh, this past weekend, uh, I think it was before the weekend started, uh, Elon comes out and says that he thinks that there's energy concerns with Bitcoin. He um, says that he's working with Dogecoin developers to make Doge better. He's watching something that as of last night, he said he still has all of it on his balance sheet, except for that 10% that he sold. He still has it sitting on his balance sheet. Um, But all of his comments are causing the price of Bitcoin to to plummet, even though it's sitting on his balance sheet. The price of Tesla is plummeting. So what I'm trying to wrap my head around why, right? I'm just asking myself, why would somebody go out and do this? Even if you did believe this stuff, you'd think you'd be quiet about it as you do more research. Um, I mean, we all know Elon is, is not your typical person, especially while on Twitter. Um, but Talk talk us through how you're interpreting all these mixed signals. It's it's so strange to me. Um, but Lynn, take it away. What are what are your thoughts? 
So I guess I mean if you look at his his history with, with Bitcoin, even before he bought it, he was kind of like flirting with Bitcoin while still while talking about Dogecoin. Uh, and back in December, he he tweeted, uh, you know, I think he I think he phrased it as uh, Bitcoin is almost as BS as fiat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember like because uh, uh, one of my one of my friends kind of highlighted that, and he's, and he's like, oh, he's gonna he's gonna make the uh, the Bitcoiners angry. And so I just put a meme out there that was like, uh, you know, it's kind of basically how like he, like basically that Winnie the Pooh meme where you know he's like he looks kind of slumpy and then he's he's in like a tux. And so I wrote like you know. Uh, like the slumpy version is being long Bitcoin and Tesla, and like the more sophisticated version is like long Bitcoin, short Tesla. Uh, and that's basically, you know, so there's a lot of kind of, um, uh, for a while, there's been kind of like a lot of pro Tesla, pro Elon yes. feelings in the Bitcoin community for a while. And I've always been somewhat out of consensus in the sense that maybe it's because I come from a, a, a a little bit more of a value investing background. You and me both, Lynn. I'm, exactly. I'm laughing because I have the same. I had. The, I've always had the same opinion. Like I never got Tesla, but I was a Bitcoiner, and I, I felt like such an oddball. Yeah, so I was always critical of Tesla, and because it, so Musk has, and it's not one of those things like you know. There's obviously good engineering happening at Tesla, um, but it's more about the fact that he tends to overpromise and underdeliver, uh, and slower than. You know his initial forecast. If you kind of go back and look at his timeline for when, you know, automatic driving would be here and things like that, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, basically, he's he's kind of inherently a marketer at heart, and he seems kind of all over the place, especially on Twitter. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's one of those things where it's really important, I think, for Bitcoin not to, you know, the the Bitcoin community not to get caught up with, you know, hero figures or. I actually think Peter McCormack phrased it best, like, you know, basically single person worship is like centralization or, you know, however he phrased it, like, uh, you know, yeah. if you're basically relying on the opinion of one man, you know, that's when you're going to run into issues. And so overall, I, I think there's even, there's a lot of theorizing about why he changed his opinion. One is just, you know, his opinion changes a lot on a lot of things. And so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a reason for it. If there is a reason for it, it's possible that, for example, because Tesla's involved in, renewable like uh, energy credits uh, that he got a tap on the shoulder from someone, for example, or the company did, you know, the adults in the room, I guess you could say, and that they had to change something up and change their opinion of the energy environment. Uh, it's really hard to say because, you know, we're not necessarily, you know, working with a, a kind of the standard CEO here. Here's a different way to look at it. This is actually the, the best thing on the planet for Bitcoin. It is proving why decentralization matters. It's so if you look at Satoshi White Paper and everything else, the root problem problem with conventional currency is that trust is required to make it work, and so and central governments have to erode, erode that trust. And so as somebody gains more and more power over you or over your finances or anything else, you're. You, the rest of society is up to kind of whim and fancy of that person. And even if that person is like, we're all trying to read in what he's thinking. I personally believe that he did get a tap on ESG and it became, okay, I have to softly backpedal. I won't totally go out, but I have to so softly backpedal to be able to protect kind of credits and everything else. That's what I believe. I could be totally wrong. It could be. He's just learning, like, and and you know how people learn, and then they go into altcoins, and they and they they're all over the map because they don't really understand it. So he could be just a very powerful person learning publicly, and 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 crazy markets all all the way through. It actually doesn't matter on each of those on each of those tangents. What matters is it's proving the thesis on why decentralization is the most important gift to humanity. Because it push, pushes the power of uh, 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 the power to individuals rather than centralizing power. So he he had, and I'm assuming Lynn, you agree with Jeff there? Yeah, I agree, and I think you know it's it's a shame that that. So it's it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of kind of a uh, you know uh, interesting news kind of get get kind of overshadowed by the Elon thing, right? So for example, I've been covering uh, you know the fact that that Nidig has had a number of interesting kind of announcements lately where that you know they brought over the executive from Bridgewater uh they they've announced like partnerships with banks uh you know to kind of you know basically to bring bitcoin to banking and so we're that's kind of 
you know, more signal to noise stuff where, you know, for example, the network effect continues to strengthen, obviously for people following Taproot, that's obviously making advancements as well. And so you actually see the underlying technology getting better. You see the network effects getting better, but then on top of that, we see we have the crazy price action and the charismatic personalities and then the, and then the Twitter wars, that's, that's the stuff that's getting, of course, 90% of the attention. Uh, and that's fine because that's what's going to, that's what's going to dictate you know, people clicking on on articles, of course, it's going to get written about a lot. And that's what's going to cause people to freak out because that's what the price action is doing. But I think, you know, for people that are kind of looking at this as, as more than kind of a tactical trade, it's really about monitoring the fundamentals, just like I would with any other type of investment. So uh, two of the things that he brought up that I think is important for us to address, because we probably have a ton of people that are listening to this that have just got into the space in the last 90 days or 100 days, and they, they might not even be ahead in their position based on how much it's gone sideways lately. Um, so the one thing that Elon brought up is he was talking about miners in China and how um, this is a centralized thing. So Lynn, I'm sure you can crank this one out of the ballpark as to addressing how this is FUD. Yeah, there's a couple. I mean, there's one is the energy FUD and one is the centralization FUD, and they're yeah. two different ones. And so basically with the centralization, you know, we saw from the, the 2017, uh, you know, the, the the differences of opinion there between, you know, different parts of the community uh, that, you know, as as the way is Bitcoin's designed is that the, really the nodes have the power. Uh, and so the, the centralization, the partial centralization of hash rate is, is not really uh, the key factor there. It's really about are, you know, is there a central development team that can kind of override, uh, you know, miners and nodes? No. Uh, is there, you know, basically a cabal of miners that can push changes through? No. It's really about the, the, the decentralized node network itself. And that's also why the Bitcoin community is so adamant about keeping uh, nodes, uh, you know, simple to run so that the, that the average person can verify the entire blockchain uh, and basically be involved in the consensus, uh, you know, over time. Uh, and so miners, of course, have a large role, but, you know, just because one country has majority of hash rate doesn't necessarily give them control over the blockchain. Uh, and so, and then the second one is the energy FUD, which, and that's, you know, there, there's pros and cons there. There's parts of things that are merit, right? So there is a big uh, mining uh, area in China. Some of it is, you know, the, the hydroelectric overcapacity where they they go there, They that's basically the cleanest, freest energy you're going to get because they're literally tapping into renewable energy, it would otherwise be wasted because it's overbuilt, you know, in, in certain areas, uh, especially, you know, during the wet season. Uh, and then, uh, but the other factor is you do have provinces in China that are more coal heavy. And so, you know, that, that is a fact. Uh, but then over time, you know, especially because China has actually moved in some ways to, to try to discourage mining in those jurisdictions, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Bitcoin proponents are in favor of, you know, trying to do actions to decentralize the mining a little bit more, bring it more towards North America, bring it to cleaner resources where possible. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, it's one of those things where the way it's it currently works, I think there's a couple issues. One is people assume that the that the energy consumption is going to be as exponential as the price increases. Uh, but the way that the block subsidy having works, that's not how it how it goes in practice, where the energy scales better. Than the than the price action over time, so there's there's that, and then two, just the fact that even though you have individual cases where say a bunch of coal kind of mines Bitcoin, the overall structure of how Bitcoin works is that it's really optimized to go around the world and kind of soak up uh, wasted energy and and basically overbuilt energy, and so the overall kind of you know big structure of, of the type of energy that Bitcoin uses. Uh, is is really a net positive, and it's the fact that you know a lot of people criticizing Bitcoin's energy use. They kind of start with the with the kind of axiom that Bitcoin's useless, and therefore energy spent on it is a waste. Whereas, for example, we don't really question uh, you know energy spent on washing machines or or you know uh, Christmas lights or you know whatever the case may be, because we know that there's varying varying degrees of use for them, and so people that really know how Bitcoin works and know why it's valuable. They know that one, the energy spend is is worthwhile. And two, that, you know, basically that over the long run, you know, that basically the incentive structure is actually pretty attractive for energy rather than this giant, you know, kind of exponentially increasing environmental drain. There was one other, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jeff, go ahead. And, 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 and so just, I, and, and what Lynn said is all true, but here's the thing. I actually think Bitcoiners don't do themselves enough favor with that argument because it's hard to understand. Now you're comparing, you're fighting the wrong battle. You're comparing what uses more energy 
and Christmas lights or this or and everything else. And, or the, it helps promote uh, renewable, which is true. Um, but, th- but if you, st- on top of that, ask anybody to explain how climate is solved through an inflationary monetary system. So you have to have growth forever and you'll de- debase your currencies to get that growth forever. So it's not real growth. Um, and, uh, and you, so you keep, so you keep growing. How is that, uh, how is that aligned with a, with, with a, a finite planet, finite resources on a finite planet? It, 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 it isn't. So if you start to there where, where Bitcoin by, by kind of forcing what's happening is as we move to more and more things becoming, um, in the cloud or digits or, or information, more th- so it, it really simple examples. If you take music, we used to buy CDs and we had limited music. We drove to the record store to buy the CDs and everything else. And there was a whole production schedule and distribution choosers who, who out of the musicians could be able to supply us music. So a whole, whole bunch of people were blocked by access to even find us because of the high cost of the distribution. Now we have unlimited music for $10 a month and we don't buy things. So GDP, so, so GDP is a bad measure because as more information, as more things become information, we get more for less. And that, that's declining GDP as we get more for less. But if you have a system that requires higher and higher GDP to pay back debt that you can't pay back, you have to keep on manipulating the system and, and, and it's not just a little bit of manipulation. So people think, okay, after this manipulation, it'll be over. Just like they thought in 2008, after that manipulation, it'll be over. Everything's good again. It's, it, it, because one system is totally opposite to the other system. It requires ever more manipulation forever to be able to do. And, and the negative consequences of that action, quite simply to say, say, should lumber prices be what they are? Should oil prices be what they are in, in COVID? They're, they're a result of money printing. They're not a result of natural supply and demand market, the result of creating more demand out of, uh, out of money printing. And, and the byproduct of that is people storing value in their houses to buy more <laughs> lumber and everything, everything else, which is net positive for a growth economy. Which it, but it's not, it's not, it's not congruent to, and by the way, I don't know if I love the answer of what I'm saying, but I would love anybody to defend uh, to me, just to to ask Elon, um, how uh, how you're going to fix the climate through an inflationary monetary system. One other thing that I wanted to highlight uh, beyond the two points that uh, Lynn brought up, which was the energy and then the centralization uh, argument the other thing that I think Elon was was bringing up with his recommendation of how he was going to uh, amend Dogecoin with the developer tweet, he was talking about making the the clearing times faster for the transaction, so you don't have to wait ten minutes. Like this is, you know, I, I'll, I'll say my comments and uh, see. If, you know, I'm assuming you guys agree. Like we are a we already have the Lightning Network, which clears immediately. Bitcoin Lightning Network. And the cost to the fees associated with the Lightning Network are near meaningless. And yet he's out there talking about this technical solution with Dogecoin. And I was just, I was just confused. It was like, there's no way that he doesn't know this, right? Or, 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 or am I out to I think lunch you, here? I think, I, I think you might give too much credit. Um, so, so, so I think there's a whole bunch of Bitcoin community that, that, uh, um, and and I get it. On on, he's doing this to manipulate stock. He's doing this for control of Dogecoin and everything else. That might be right, or or he's doing it to gain more power or influence. That might that might be right too. But I don't think it it, it, it just might be he doesn't know. Yeah, he's busy with so many other things. Yeah, and you're asking sure. him to be—you're asking him to be an expert without, and he hasn't gone down to the sand on all of this stuff, and and he's promoting, and it doesn't—it it sure doesn't look like an expert 
on any of these things. Um, and, and that's the thing with Bitcoin. Um, there are so many smart people in this space that that want real answers, want the truth. And so if you put something out there that, that flies in the face of it, you'll be attacked. Um, I, I, we would need to be careful about that. We need to be careful about everything being price action. <laughs> yeah. That, um, because the importance of the network is far greater than price action. I, I understand how price action is a part of it, but, uh, but the, the real importance for, for where we're going as a, as a species um, is way more important than the price action. I was going to say, I'll second all of that. And what I was going to say when you're, with your initial questions, is that I think that Elon should look into the Lightning Network uh, because, you know, there has been a ton of development that on that over the past couple of years. We have a lot of, obviously, we have a lot of apps coming out that are making use of it. But then also there's the work that like Lightning Labs does, you know, to kind of, you know, basically provide a lot of those apps with the, with the technology that allows them to function. Uh, we're getting kind of more and more network effects and usability in that network over time. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, my base case is that Elon just doesn't know and that, you know, I think people give him too much credit, assume he's a genius mm. at anything he touches. Whereas, you know, I, I will say, you know, using myself as an example, you know, I cover multiple asset classes. I cover multiple stocks within the equity universe, let alone what multiple commodities are doing, what central banks are doing, what different countries are doing. And so, you know, studying Bitcoin over the past couple of years has been a large project to, to spin up on and to be able to contribute, you know, and, and basically educate other people on it uh, and make sure that I'm not saying stuff that I don't know. And, and you know, that, that's basically involved a very, very large chunk of my time to really go down that rabbit hole and understand it. And in order of, you know, and while I'm doing that, I'm still balancing all these other asset classes that I'm monitoring for, you know, literally thousands of, of readers and, 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 you know, kind of maintaining awareness of that. And so, you know, for me, when I got into Bitcoin, Lightning was one of the things that I was aware of. Like it basically, it it's I knew it solved certain problems, but I never, you know, that was one of the later things that I, I kind of dove into, you know, after kind of getting the the base layer figured out, right? So if he's if he's he's you know keeping track of what's happening at SpaceX, what's happening at Tesla, and you know whatever happens in his personal life, and then he's getting into into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and Dogecoin because now he's distracted in Dogecoin, and then you know so. What degree has of research has he done, for example, on Lightning? Uh, and also, you know, has he spun up on the fact that he's he's basically presenting certain arguments about block size and things like that that have basically been debated for for like five years now by people that are that are deep into this industry, and basically just kind of seems to lack a, a knowledge of history about kind of you know where some of the decision points were made, how we got to this, how some of the different forks kind of turned out. And so, yeah, my base case is that he just hasn't really spun up on that particular area. Uh, in a way that that maybe he should have before, you know, making a, a, a billion dollar investment in the asset class. You do all those yeah. things, Lynn, but you also write in an encyclopedia on inflation on a Tuesday morning and and blast it out. <laughs> well, that's an example of something that it took two weeks of writing that, and then you know it comes out on a Tuesday. That was a Tuesday of- morning. That don't give me two <laughs> weeks. I don't believe it. <laughs> But it, but to it just build on Lynn's point and and go to other people not not as deep in the Bitcoin community, who who have some of these same mistakes as they go through their journey. Yeah. I would say I, w- I would say it's most yeah, um, including me going through it in, in the beginning. Michael Saylor, look at his tweets on Bitcoin before he before he gained conviction. So part of the thing is you start to go down to the sand. You get smarter and smarter and smarter. He's just doing that publicly, and everybody thinks it's, he's already a genius and knows all the answers. Jeff, so what are the board conversations going to sound like after all this Elon stuff? Do, do you see it changing? Do you see people putting a lot of uh, credence in in some of that fud that's been put out there, or is it just kind of like, okay, well, that's that guy's opinion. Well, let's have the conversation we were intended to have. I would say al- almost zero. It hasn't changed at all. In fact, in fact, th- this conversation is accelerating. Um, ever, the, the more, actually, e- even Elon on this forces forces the truth to come out, and more and more questioning on it. And there's been a lot of this from really smart Bitcoiners uh, that, that, that have come out, and it deserves an answer, right? That that how how does inflation how does an inflationary monetary policy handle climate deserves an answer. If you yeah. don't have an answer, 
then and you just oh look over here i'm selling cars uh it, it like it tell me how <laughs> and if you don't have an answer and that's kind of how I, th I think about it then i'm long bitcoin until i see something different that has a, and then here's another i was asked this question recently on why bitcoin and why not ethereum or why anything else I actually don't, when we go into the protocol and what, what this is, um, I think there's a unique set of circumstances that built Bitcoin to the, uh, to this point. And, and so let's take a whole bunch of the other coins, which I don't really look at at, uh, at all. So why am I a maximalist? Um, so not that I could, couldn't make money on some of the other coins in the short term, but I need to know enough about them to be able to make money. And I don't know enough about, uh, about them. And I, uh, but so, but why am I Maximus on, on Bitcoin is because, because of the two things, one that the network effect on Bitcoin and when, where it is. Um, uh, and I don't do not think a smaller coin could ever get passed and broad enough adoption through uh, out of out of government before it was shut down, if it if it ga was gaining enough adoption. I think that so we have a we have a point in time that Bitcoin is big enough and has been flown under the radar for long enough that could actually bring. Uh, that still has power. decentralization. Exactly, it has decentralization. Yeah. And I think if it didn't win, and that's actually why I'm kind of against a whole bunch of coin, other coins, if it didn't win, then things will be centralized. That's a, that's that. And, and so, and then I, you're back to square one because then, and gonna... then you're back, then you're back to square, then you're back to square one. And, and in the world we're moving into, so it's not the world we came from centralization in the world we're moving into. If, so if if essentially you can control it, centralization means uh, uh, it ultimately eventually is on a paradigm of dictatorship because because you have to you have to because if technology is deflationary and move exponentially more so and then move, moving more and you run kind of an inflationary policy against that what it means is uh, you're you're aggregating more and more power in the state. Over time, that turns into, I, I often ask myself, why in Russia uh, doesn't everybody just revolt, right? Why doesn't everybody stand up and say, I'm done with this. We're, we're, we're going to have free and open elections and everything else. And, and what ends up happening is um, a very small number of minority will, but most people won't. They'll go to the, the short term, short term safety for their family. They'll make the case that I'm just going to stay quiet. Now, now think about that scenario with, uh, with centralization, with robotics and AI, and think about the, how how different that power is. So, if people won't stand up in a in a system where you can still find anonymity and 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 find kind of a way to stand up and rally enough people around you to stand up. If people won't do that now, or they historically won't, or not enough people to overthrow a, a, a government, how would that look uh, with where we're going with technology? So, so decentralization and putting this power into, a, in, into empowering individuals in where we're going, I think is critical for humanity. I think it is that big a deal. And that's actually why that, the, and I, the truth is, I don't think anything's going to stop Bitcoin, no matter what, where we are right now. But when I see a bunch of, a bunch of FUD or altcoins or trying to all everything else that's kind of taking that, that could hurt people as a result of this big innovation and why, why it's so important. That's why I'm only Bitcoin. That's why I defend. That's why I would defend that network because because it matters that much. Not for, I I don't need it for my wealth. Lynn, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I think you know it's one of those things where I think it's like uh, you know people always often criticize Bitcoiners as being you know kind of all or nothing, and 
you know, it's kind of like an immune response system where, you know, it, you know, it's one of those things where normally it's a good thing. Sometimes in individual cases, it's a bit much, you know, here and there. But overall, that's an important part of kind of what's what's kept Bitcoin going for as long as it has. Uh, and, you know, kind of that that hardcore focus on keeping Bitcoin decentralized, maintaining the network effect. Uh, that's kind of an important thing to, to play out. And so I, I do think that overall education is a really important thing to, to keep doing for people. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's important not to take for granted the idea that Bitcoin will succeed. It's going to succeed based on, you know, the, the development of the community and the network effect over time. And that involves people, you know, kind of calling out FUD where they see it, uh, sharing education where they see it. Uh, you know, I try to do my part by tackling different subjects and kind of, you know, writing about them, uh, you know, for kind of both a retail and institutional audience. Uh, and so, for example, I think that, you know, one of the, my views is that, you know, one of the the more significant risks for Bitcoin is the ESG narrative. Uh, and I think that's because, so people often talk about state attacks, right? But, you know, state attacks can come wrapped in other types of attacks. You can have a state attack that's wrapped in an ESG uh, concern. Right. So it is true, for example, that we see a lot of uh, companies around the world, um, you know, are shifting more towards trying to emphasize their their ESG abilities. And, you know, like anyone else, I'm in favor of, of trying to make the world, you know, as clean a place as possible, as trying to have the best governance as possible, social concerns. Uh, but, you know, sometimes those can be, you know, the things they optimize for are not necessarily, you can have like a thing of greenwashing rather than being truly green, for example. Right. So, you know, I'm certainly in favor of cleaner energy, uh, but I'm not in favor of things that are kind of greenwashed, things that make you feel good, but don't actually move the needle. And so I think that's one of those things that can apply to Bitcoin, where if people don't, you know, make sure people are, are familiar with the details of how Bitcoin uses energy, uh, that that people can get carried away with that sort of FUD. And it's, it's, I think it's good to keep educating people on it. So what you're really saying is you think that there could be a coordinated effort amongst policymakers to ban a proof of work and proof of stake is the only thing that that is allowable. Is, it, is that kind of what you're getting at? I mean, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the things, uh, you know, that's possible, but you can have less extreme versions of that, right? You can basically make it so that, you know, if, if you have Bitcoin on your balance sheet, that's damaging to your ESG score or that, you know, that basically you have to, you know, you're on the wrong side of renewable energy credits, for example, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, whereas, you know, for example, when you have uh, research being put out by ARC, for example, I, you know, I, I, there's there's areas where I agree or disagree with ARC on, on different subjects. Uh, but one of the things they, I think, are great on is putting out open research about different topics. And they've kind of put out research about it, Bitcoin's energy usage and Bitcoin's energy efficiency. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, you can have soft or hard attacks uh, where, you know, you kind of use one narrative to push another narrative. Uh, and so, you know, I was asked the question before in an interview, uh, do I think Bitcoin's energy concerns are a problem? And I said, no, but that I think the narrative around Bitcoin's energy concerns could be a problem. And that was actually shortly before, you know, Elon's kind of turn on this. And, and this ended up being an oddly specific example of how the narratives around that can be a concern, uh, even though the underlying technology and energy use, uh, in my view, does make a lot of sense. That's a, that, that is exactly, I think, what's happening. If I talk to a lot of, I'm involved in some of the ESG companies, but here's the difference today in, in some of them. They're hitting a point of inflection where, where they're cost competitive to existing and better cost. That's when ESG moves. And, and again, it reinforces the cycle. And so I come back to the principal thing. If that's good for that, you would argue that that's good for the environment. A winning, a winning, uh, a winning technology that is both clean, green, and it's cheaper than their existing alternative. And but it, but that that thing is more deflation. And so I keep coming back to. So you're going to print a whole bunch of money to be able to make prices go down more, to be able to print a bunch of money. It's the, it, so the system itself, but to, Lynn, to Lynn's point, I do agree with that. I don't, I don't, uh, the, the, the attack vector becomes a lot of people believe, uh, believe that Bitcoin is a problem for energy, is a problem for, for the environment. And that becomes the attack vector on, on Bitcoin. 
Lynn, what are your thoughts? If you were going to break it down simply for people that are listening to this, they hear us say proof of work, proof of stake. Uh, they're new to the space. Can you summarize the difference between the two and then um, talk about how these ESG concerns um, kind of pop up between the two different uh, methods of implementing the protocols, uh, validation and security? Sure. And yeah, basically the way the blockchains work is that you have to put up something of value to to verify the blockchain, to have your your vote matter in a way in a way of speaking. Uh, and with with proof of stake, you're basically using your existing units of that of that blockchain. Uh, in some cases you're risking them in order to select, you know, which version of the blockchain is valid. Uh, and with proof of work, you're contributing energy. Uh, you know, you're you're basically taking electricity and you're you're solving uh, hash functions, uh, and then you're kind of voting on on which blocks are valid blocks. And if if your vote if you end up choosing a block that that ends up not being kind of the longest chain, uh, you've wasted that work. Uh, and so there's an incentive to make sure you're voting for the the correct the long that you think is going to be the longest and most valid uh, chain. Uh, and so you know there are different consensus mechanisms, uh, and you know. Uh, uh, y- I think the the argument against proof of stake is essentially that the existing system is proof of stake, uh, not necessarily in the little sense of the blockchain, but in the sense that basically, you know, if you if you own chunks of the system, you have more say over the, the functioning of the system. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, proof of work is more, if anything, is actually, you know, what what gives gold value over the long term is that it's essentially proof of work. Basically, someone dug through literally tons and tons and tons of rock in order to, you know, basically collect one ounce of gold. And basically you've, you've, you've taken a ton of energy and condensed it into one ounce of, of rare metal, right? So that, that's kind of the original proof of work. Uh, and so Bitcoin is, is kind of, you know, this, this, the digital proof of work. Uh, and so overall, you have those two different systems. And, in, you know, in, in general, a proof of work systems, you know, going to use more energy, whereas a proof of stake system, uh, you know, it, it, you know, you say say you take Ethereum's case, which starts as proof of work, but then they're trying to become proof of stake, so it's kind of more self-referential, uh, and so technically that can be a lighter functioning system, but you're giving up some of the, the the benefits of decentralization and all these other things that are kind of the key part of why these blockchains are are useful technology, because it's, as soon as you have a non-centralized blockchain, uh, what you essentially have is a you know kind of a decentralization theater. You have like a really expensive database, more or less. Uh, there's basically a, le- a less efficient version of a se- of a fully centralized database. And so, you know, when it comes to decentralization, it's almost all or nothing. Either you have either you have sufficient decentralization where it's kind of believably decentralized, uh, or you have dis- you know kind of varying shades of inefficient databases. And if you're moving to a proof of stake after a proof of work has mind a sufficient like a meaningful amount of the overall supply and you're moving towards a proof of stake and you don't have uh full nodes that can be run by anybody at a very cheap cost the the issues that you're describing comparing it to the existing system that we have today where the people that hold all the wealth are the ones that get to make up the rules i think only amplify itself in uh, that type of scenario that I just described, where you have a few people that are literally running data centers, call it 10 years from now, uh, because the block size is so, so, so large uh, that you know somebody can't just take $200 and run a full note at their house. I think it becomes even more concerning. But, um, and I'm assuming. Exactly. And I think a really good example is 2017 with Bitcoin. Right. So when when that kind of, you know, different when when debates were being had about expanding the block size, you know, originally you had a lot of big players on board with expanding the block size. You had a lot of the big mining pools uh, and you had a lot of the big exchanges. Uh, And if that was a proof of stake system, uh, you know, that change would have had a higher probability of going through and, and being made. Uh, you know, even if it was against the, you know, the consensus, you know, the majority of users, but because, uh, you know, with, with Bitcoin's design, it, you know, the nodes really have kind of the final say on a lot of things, uh, you know, that, you know, despite the fact that you kind of started with a, a pretty significant consensus of some of the power players, they were not able to, you know, push those changes through. Uh, and so that that's, my, in my view, one of the, the big tests of decentralization and proof of work uh, and why there's a you know, big importance of 
you know, making running a full node accessible and making that a widely distributed thing, because otherwise what you're pr pr basically building is a PayPal, right? We already have that. And so that's, you know, that's how some people are thinking about it. Whereas if your starting point is you want to make decentralized base settlement layer, right? A truly decentralized one, then, you know, Bitcoin pretty much nails that. And all these other ones in many ways are missing the point and they're replicating these decentralized things that we already have. So Lynn, that point, if, you, if you're trying to compete against Bitcoin and you're an entrepreneur that wants to do something else and so you've had a whole bunch of, you see Bitcoin success, you spin up as something else that looks different, that uses different energy that you've convinced people that this is a better mousetrap. That's actually the exact point. The, uh, that's what you would do as an entrepreneur. That's what all the entrepreneurs in that are doing. And, but the problem is it's all, it, it, it's all centralized. It all becomes centralized. Yep. And hey guys, what were your thoughts? So, uh, Stanley Drucken Miller had a massive CNBC interview last week. I think most have forgotten about it because of all the Elon stuff. But this was a massive interview and the stuff that he was saying, I mean, Joe Kiernan on uh, Squawk Box, he like stopped. He's like, are you really saying what I think you just said? And he's like, yeah, I am. So uh, I'm kind of curious to hear some of your thoughts on that one. I mean, so for people that aren't familiar with Stanley Druckenmiller, because uh, he's not as much of a household name to say Warren Buffett is, uh, but for anybody in macro, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller is the Tom Brady of macro. Right. I mean, he's he's the goat of macro. He's he's the guy with like the 30 year track record of of like no down years. Right. Just just insane uh, kind of macro forecasting. Uh, and he's really good with current currencies uh, are, are, and, and bonds are kind of his main forte. But he dabbles across multiple asset classes. And the reason he's got such a strong reputation is he can trade multiple types of markets, bull markets, bear markets, different currency regimes, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, he's not, you know, as an older investor now, he's not one of the people that has say been, been on Bitcoin from the beginning, but he was kind of like Paul Tudor Jones, one of these, you know, the, one of the macro people that were open enough to, you know, have a non-zero allocation of Bitcoin uh, fairly early for someone, you know, with, with billions of dollars of asset to manage where it once became big enough to be on his radar, where he could he could buy a little bit without moving the price too much, and actually, even when he bought into it, he he still found that he he basically said he was still moving the price, and he you know and so that actually kind of limited how much he could do. Uh, but overall, yeah, he he gave a really good interview where he talked about the changing of the dollar's reserve currency status. Uh, he talked about a lot about the, uh, the you know the fiscal issues that we're facing, uh, kind of right out of the Luke Groman playbook, uh, you know right you know, coming from Stanley Druckenmiller at, on a kind of a bigger stage. Uh, and he also, you know, he gave an interesting comment about Bitcoin's network effect compared to some of the other uh, tokens uh, in the sense that he's he's undecided about which blockchains will win, win some of these, you know, smart contract or, or payment platform things that are happening. Uh, and he thinks there's a good chance that some of the current leaders get displaced by by newer entrants at some point. Uh, but he was also firm that he thinks as a store of value that it's really, really hard to unseat Bitcoin. And I think he's done uh, you know pretty good research on Bitcoin's network effect uh, in that area compared to you know the whole array of of you know altcoins out there. How about his comments on the dollar, Lynn? I mean, it's it's one of those things where I, I certainly like it because it, it's stuff I've been talking about for the past you know few years now, which is essentially that you know with with the current fiscal situation of the U.S. and the fact that they you know they don't really have much of an, of a choice other than to maintain negative real interest rates on their on their debt under the current structure of how much debt is in the economy and and you know how default works and things like that, where they're kind of trapped in that system, uh, and he's he's you know. He's inclined towards thinking that we're in a, a major dollar bear market. Uh, he he sees a more you know somewhat inflationary outcome, uh, and he thinks that you know as we look out 15 years or so, uh, the, you know the current reserve structure, uh, uh, you know basically the the foundation of our monetary system is going to shift you know away from the dollar uh, to the sense that it's not really the epicenter of the system that it that it currently is now. Uh, and I think there's there's nuances where him and I might see little. Th things a little bit differently but overall he's you know he's kind of on that that you know that dollar bear uh somewhat inflationary outcome uh which is the way i've been seeing things for a while uh and you know he gave an interview a little while ago 
uh, I think it was two months ago, and I included some of his quotes in my, I think it was my February newsletter or March newsletter, uh, because, you know, I, I think he's been doing really good commentary on some of the things we're seeing in terms of fiscal policy, monetary policy, uh, broad money supply growth, uh, the inflation versus deflation debate. Uh, I think he's been he's been pretty sharp on that in the past, uh, you know, six months or so. So, guys, uh, Caitlin Long. I don't know if you guys saw the post that she had recently on Tether. Do you guys have any thoughts on some of her comments there? I didn't see that one, Preston. Lynn, did you happen to see it? I, I think I saw part of it, but I had, I had so many things on my plate. I know that you know one of the concerns with Tether is that it, it's you know, they, they release documents about its backing, uh, and it, it, it's, it's still rather opaque, uh, and, and kind of unclear backing, you could say. Uh, and, and so it's one of those things where, you know, I, I've used stable coins, uh, but I personally don't use tether just, I, I prefer some of the other stable coins, the, the more kind of, you know, regulated stable coins, it, you know, for, for periods of time where I use stable coins, um, uh, I, I kind of put I put out a, a tweet that just kind of it kind of indirectly mentioned uh, kind of kind of referenced Tether, where I pointed out that you know if if you deposit money in the U.S. banking system, uh, it is forty six percent backed by uh, Treasuries and cash, uh, and then the other fifty four percent is of a, a variety of loans and things like that. Uh, that's that's basically how the the U.S. banking system works, and that's actually above average. So you know over the past several decades. You know, the average cash and treasury backing was more like 30%. Uh, and the rest was a, a variety of more risky loans because that's what banks do. Uh, and so things can always be phrased or kind of framed in, in negative ways where you make something sound scary. Uh, you know, in Tether's case, I, you know, I've never been on the board where I, I fully trust what, what, what they're doing over there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think it's, it's some of the concerns are overblown in the sense that, you know, what is really you know, structurally moved markets is big pools of capital buying Bitcoin, moving it off exchanges into cold storage, and and kind of just supp- causing a supply constraint. Whereas Tether is is heavily used in the day to day trading of it as a unit of account. Uh, and so, basically, if we were to see a problem with Tether, I think it would it would turn out a lot like this Elon event, where you'd have these periods of volatility and and periods of you know big problems in structures and markets. Uh, but it doesn't change the underlying, you know, kind of technology and network effect of Bitcoin itself. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So uh, here's a question for you, Jeff. Uh, this is from Lloyd Robinson. He asked, I heard Jeff on Salt Talks a few months ago. He was asked several times how Bitcoin fixes our inflationary monetary system. I don't think the interviewer got a satisfactory answer and neither did I. I would love to understand how Bitcoin fixes this so I can explain it to others. So again, um, technology is it provides efficiency, and in a, in a normal world, that would be deflationary. So a free market and technology would equal deflation. The only reason it doesn't equal deflation is because we have a monetary policy that won't allow it to. That monetary policy that won't allow it to, and that's actually the, in this inflation deflation debate all the time. We live in a macro world, and the overall macro ba- backdrop is deflationary, exponentially deflationary. And so, when people ask, "Well, when is it going to be inflationary? When's it going to be?" Because that's not what they experience. Because they experience a system that is is printing more money, that's making prices go up. Um, so, so we, so if you. And when I say Bitcoin isn't deflationary in itself, it allows for the free market to work, which would would allow deflation. So, so it would so and and they and as that is, it allows deflation. So it is allowed. If there were growth, if there were more real jobs, if there if there were more more growth of things without monetary policy, then you would grow. Right, you wouldn't uh, you know, like the, the the that would ex, that would ex, expand, but if more things went to technology, essentially saving our time, that would ha- that would naturally be broadly shared with humanity instead of instead of concentrated. So the same thing why why Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, everything else are able to concentrate the gains as much as they are, besides the network effect. Or the concentrate is the same reason that the the uh, billionaires 
um, concentrate out of the printing of the money. And so, so what, what, what's happening is in a free, if, if I just, if I, if I simply said, even a free market, a free market, as long as you're not continually making mistakes, unless you're growing huge new industries that are replacing more jobs than are lost, then, then that free market must essentially, if you said human innovation is, is getting better all the time and you're adding more then that must equal deflation over time. We don't see it normally because we don't, it, we've never lived in a world that's moved as fast as it's moving today. And so, so you could, you could hide inflation and you, and the policy response to what we're talking about didn't have to be as big today. The policy response on where we are on this train um, has to be, it has to grow. And that's what I talked about in my, in my book, it has to grow exponentially to offset and it, it, uh, to offset what's happening with technology. It used to, one more thing. So when we, when we used to measure economist models and everything else, when you'd say deflation is made up and it is true of demographics, that would be a big part. There's deflationary uh, pressures um, or that when you offshore all your production to, to China. And so all of these things matter in the overall, but they matter less and less compared to technology. So to, as technology is exponentially increasing its impact on our world and more and more of the base layer is moving to technology, that base layer requires a natively digital currency that won't allow for manipulation because otherwise the manipulation equals more, more, more control, more centralized control, it's a centrally planned market. So Lynn, you came out with your article on Ethereum and um, it had a, a lot of readership. Um, I think you laid out some amazing things in there that would take a. We could we could cover that for an hour and a half. In fact, I reached out to Vitalik to come on and and have a discussion. We didn't hear anything back from him. Maybe we need to just do a whole episode on your Ethereum article. I'll have it in the show notes for people to look at and read because it is amazing. Um, but. With all that said, when we look at the price action of Ethereum compared to Bitcoin over the last, I'd say, two months, it has aggressively outperformed Bitcoin. What do you think's going on? Um, and do you see a situation where even though you're making all these fundamental uh, arguments, which I completely agree with, do you see this having the capacity to, to achieve a higher market cap in the coming, you know, six months or year, uh, moving forward, I'm kind of curious to hear if any 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 of your analysis have changed based on how the market's valuing it, um, and just some of your thoughts. Yeah, that's no, a really good set of questions. And so, you know, for people who aren't aware of it, I basically analyzed Ethereum. Uh, it was somewhat of a critical analysis, so it wasn't super favorable towards Ethereum. Uh, there's a couple points where I, you know, I was, yeah, I try to be fair as possible, right? So if something, if it's doing something interesting, I, I say, okay, this part's interesting. Uh, but you know, it, oh, kind of the the net overall case was was rather critical and why I why I prefer Bitcoin as an investment. Uh, and it really comes down to decentralization. That that you know, I I ultimately view Ethereum more like an equity where you're 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 in a sense, people that are buying into it are are betting on the development team. Being able to push out updates and and, and structure how they want to basically make this the system that they envision, uh, rather than a decentralized you know digitally native form of money, uh, which is which is what Bitcoin is, uh, and you know in any historically whenever we have these these alt seasons happen, you know, generally there's there's you know one big alt season per Bitcoin halving cycle, and you start to get this uh, inverse relationship between quality and price action. Where you know literally the the worst coins do the best, the best coins do the worst, and so the funny thing is you know you can you can characterize this Ethereum bull run as you know though it's basically some people are saying does that mean it's it's fundamentally improving, uh, and it's one of those things where at, even though Ethereum outperformed Bitcoin, if you go down the quality spectrum, you have even smaller coins outperforming Ethereum, right? So the fact that Ethereum Classic outperformed Ethereum year to date. Does that mean that Ethereum Classic's network effect is gaining on Ethereum's network effect? I would I would say probably not. 
right? I mean, for anyone that knows technical details, I mean, the network effect is on Ethereum, not Ethereum Classic. Uh, and same thing with, you know, you have Dogecoin, right? So it is Dogecoin, it certainly had a surge in popularity, but for anyone who knows kind of the, what is, you know, people that have shared their experiences running a full node for Dogecoin or how that actual network functions or what kind of development, you know, crickets have taken place over the past couple of years, basically what we've had is kind of an uh, inverse correlation between price action and quality uh, year to date. And that, that, that's happened in previous, uh, you know, kind of uh, bull markets. And, you know, it's one of those things where I, you know, after I wrote my Ethereum article, I mean, I even, I even wrote in the article that I wouldn't be surprised to see it, you know, outperform Bitcoin on the bull leg of the of the market. I'd be more concerned about how it does along with other altcoins on the bear market portion of the cycle. Uh, and because I, I have a research service, I, you know, I cover Bitcoin frequently, but I've occasionally touched on Ethereum for a broader picture. And I keep reiterating you know, for a while now that I was like, okay, if it breaks over this level, that's very bullish for the price action. Uh, and I would, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'd give another update and say, yep, it still looks, you know, bullish for the price action. And I kept reiterating why, you know, personally, I, I'm, you know, I, I think Bitcoin is the more structurally sound uh, protocol, but that you can separate, you know, fundamentals from price action and say, you know, for people that follow Ethereum, uh, here's what the price action looks like. It's bullish, uh, but just... <laughs> Be, if you want to go that route, be really careful because there's, you know, I kept reiterating that I have concerns about decentralization and, and you know, kind of the underlying use case or the kind of the reason for existence of the protocol uh, compared to Bitcoin, which I view as a, a more sound investment. You know, Sam, can I build on to uh, onto that? Because yeah. I think there's an important part. So, so today, a network effect is when the value to each user gets uh, stronger and stronger from a network effect. There are a lot of people in the 90, late 90s, early 2000s that mistook network effects for eyeballs. So they were buying more eyeballs, thinking it was a network effect, and that growth would always be there. But, in, but if it's not making the network better for all users, then the network effect doesn't exist. So now let's took a look at a time period and say Lightning wasn't there five years ago and Ethereum was there. Um, and, and so Ethereum kind of, and then the whole NFT craze came on. So, so there is actually as value and people think there's value on, on Ethereum because NFT is as driving as a whole, a whole bunch of more people, more people on it. So let's ex examine that for what it is. I totally agree with Lynn, by the way, on it could outperform in the short term, but not in the long term. And this is it now let's, so let's look at the NFTs, which is driving a whole bunch of the rate of growth on, on uh, Ethereum. I look at the NFT market like I would look at Groupon from a business. Do you remember Groupon? Mm-hmm. So, so Groupon created an incredible business by getting everybody to buy the one thing, right? And, and, and so they had one great deal that everybody bought. But the only way to scale that business was to add more things. And as they scaled, the, the, it just became noise, more and more noise. And then nobody cared about the one thing anymore because it was noise. And then there was so many, so many other competitors that did the exact same thing. When I look at NFTs on top of the primary source of value in the in the growth rate today of Ethereum, that's how I that that's what I look. So I discount that growth because mm. it's not a stable business over time. I'm I'm not questioning the NFTs can't have value. I'm questioning the how much value compared to what they will have if everything is digitized and I get to buy something that I get to say is mine. Um, and so today there's a whole bunch of people thinking, wow, that's going to be the staggering business. And I think they're overvaluing it like they overvalued Groupon that then fell to the floor. And, and apart from that, and this is where Druckmiller and agree, um, that technology might just be built onto Lightning Network on the Baseport protocol or something else kind of based on the, it didn't exist before, but now it's starting to emerge. And, and so what's being built on top of Bitcoin on the, on the network is just in its infancy. And we're gonna see a whole realm of things tied into the, 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 the base protocol. Yeah, one thing I was gonna say is the example of stable coins. And that's something I've, I've covered a little bit in my theory article and elsewhere, 
which is that you know some of the earlier stable coins uh, you know were tied to the Bitcoin network. Uh, and then when you had Ethereum, you started to have them move over to Ethereum, right? Because it was cheaper and, and kind of made for that sort of thing. Uh, and then now, as, as Ethereum's got more expensive, uh, you've had stablecoin usage uh, spill over onto Tron, uh, of all things. And so, you know, the problem with, with utility protocols is that when you start sacrificing, you know, certain variables, basically you're, you're, you're making things more efficient in exchange for uh, uh, centralization. Then another protocol can come around and make things even more efficient, but with more centralization, right. where basically until it just approximates the database. Um, and so that's that's what we're seeing in the stablecoin space, where you know it, it started out with you know the smaller transactions. You know they have a more incentive to move to a cheaper chain because if you're doing a hundred dollar transaction, you can't pay fifty dollars for a transaction. But if you're if you're doing a ten thousand dollar transaction, then you can. Right, so smaller, but as the fees get higher and higher, a bigger chunk of the of the uses spills over onto uh, uh, that other protocol. Uh, and the same thing's happening, you know, with with Binance. It's another kind of a uh, you know decently sized network effect that is kind of coming into that space. Uh, and and this was outlined in in John uh, Pfeffer's paper uh, several years ago, where utility protocols essentially have to compete on price, uh, and so the network effects are not going to be as strong there. Uh, as they will be for something like Bitcoin, uh, and you know, I, I've spoken with John before, and you know, he's 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 certainly he, he's paying pretty close attention to this industry. I think he has really really good points on that, and and I, I I generally agree with that paper, where you know, even if you do get some degree of network effect in the utility uh, protocol space, which for example Ethereum has for for a number of years, uh, that doesn't necessarily translate into long term token uh, pr- appreciation. Uh, because your 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 reason for existing is going to be constantly threatened by by uh, cheaper, more centralized competitors, uh, and whereas whereas Bitcoin doesn't really have that problem because the entire point is to just be a decentralized store of value, and then you can build other things on top of it to make it a better and better payment network and a smart contract network and whatever the case may be. If if people want to add those features, so for example, the Lightning Network is obviously a really good use case there that that you know basically strengthens Bitcoin. But that the underlying protocol is has a lot more defenses against competitors compared to those utility protocols. In your article, you were talking about Infura uh, with your Ethereum article, and on the website for Infura, this was the quote that you put in the article. It said, "It can get expensive to store the full ETH blockchain, and these costs will scale as you add more nodes to expand your infrastructure." As your infrastructure becomes more complex, you may need full-time site reliability engineers and DevOps teams to help you maintain it. Um, And that's today, right? Like those statements are being made today. And that's why they're saying that a person should outsource that to them to manage. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, how, how is that something that in the long term is going to remain decentralized? And well, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Especially as you move over to Ethereum 2.0 and, and because they're running into scaling issues just like, you know, uh, Bitcoin would without Lightning, for example, where, you know, they can only handle so many transactions. Fees get very high on Ethereum. Uh, but unlike Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin, the average transaction size is pretty big. Uh, so it can withstand pretty high fees. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you need uh, smaller transactions, smaller fees, that's what Lightning Network is for. Um, uh, whereas in Ethereum, you're doing more complex transactions. Like for example, if you're doing different swaps and, and things like that, you're you know you're paying very very high fees, uh, and so there's a strong incentive to spill over onto onto cheaper chains. Uh, and then so Ethereum 2.0 is is trying to scale, right? So it's trying to do more on the base layer, uh, and so you know they're, they they they've they've changed the roadmap a number of times. Uh, but you know, basically, you can have different types of nodes and different types of you know. You basically almost like an army of different nodes where you know certain things are kind of validating certain certain parts of the blockchain because nothing is is big enough to validate the entire blockchain unless you're running a data center. Uh, and so that just it, again, it becomes a rather uh, centralized entity. Uh, and there's really you know when it comes to blockchains, there's two types of centralization to to worry about. One is uh, the the technical uh, decentralization. Uh, which is what you get, for example, if Infura goes down, you run into kind of blockchain-wide issues, for example. Um, that, that's a kind of a, a technical uh, centralization issue. And then two would be 
developer centralization where you know say uh, you know one foundation or one team has the capability to push through changes uh, you know more easily and, and change monetary policy or, or change designs. Uh, whereas if you have something that, that's more inherently decentralized, it requires true consensus to, to support. And so there's, there's, they, they overlap certainly those two types of centralization, but they are, are slightly different in, in kind of the risks involved. Guys, that's all I have uh, for tonight. And I know we went late, Lynn, but and Jeff, both you guys, um, I reached out to you today to record this and you both said yes. And um, I can't thank you enough uh, give people a handoff to where they can learn more about you and some of the links and all that stuff we'll have in the show notes. But Lynn, go ahead and fire away. Uh, I'm at lindalden.com. I'm also active on Twitter at Lynn Alden Contact, and you know a lot of my work's public, so people can check that out. And I, I, and I cover Bitcoin. I cover a bunch of other asset classes. I cover macro in general. Uh, so basically, whatever asset class you're into, uh, you know, hopefully my work can can help people out. And my best place for me is at Jeff Booth on Twitter. And Jeff has an amazing book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow. We'll have a link for that, for that in the show notes as well. Uh, guys, thanks so much for making time. Thanks. Thanks much. for having us. Hey, so thanks for everybody listening into the show. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to subscribe to the show on whatever podcast app you're using. We really appreciate that. And if you have time, leave us a review. So thanks for joining us this week and we'll catch you next Wednesday. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 